ever scroll through the news and you just get hit with this like wave of, I don't know, almost dread, economy shaky, the climate, politics going crazy. It's like we're trying to drive through fog with no headlights. Yeah, it's a lot right now. Yeah, so yeah. much change so fast. No wonder people are feeling a bit unsteady. Unsteady, lost, pick your metaphor. <laughs> but it gets you thinking, how do we navigate this? Well, today's deep dive might have some clues. We're looking at this article, Knowledge, Reason, and Rebellion, really made me think about how powerful knowledge is, especially now. The author's point is, it's not just knowing facts. It's like, knowledge is the map and the compass for these wild times. I like that map and compass because, yeah, we're definitely searching for direction here. And they start off with this idea of the tree of knowledge, but it's bearing, quote, crabbed fruit. Like, we're trying to learn, but it's not getting us what we need. Yeah, and they see this crabbed fruit as a sign of a bigger problem. We don't use knowledge responsibly. Mm -hmm. Like they point to stuff like vandalism being up, those yeah. destructive strikes, almost like we've forgotten what it's FOR. Man, that crabbed fruit image, it's spot on when you think about it. Look at online arguments, right? We've got all this info, but it's like we'd rather yell than actually listen. <laughs> Missing the whole point of knowledge, you know? Exactly. And then the author gets into this difference between reason and knowledge and how one without the other, it's dangerous. Right, because you can reason your way to any conclusion if you're starting with the wrong facts. That's where that Caleb Balderstone example comes in. Yeah, Totally. Balderstone, he's that servant, blindly loyal, will lie for his master. It's like even if your reasoning seems solid without good knowledge as the base, you end up, well, lying for your master. Which brings us to Shakespeare, of course, because nobody does drama like the bard himself. The author talks about Othello, King Lear, all these plays where characters make terrible choices because their reasoning's off. And it's still so relevant, centuries later. Like, Othello's so driven by jealousy, but it's all based on Iago's lies. His logic makes sense, except the info he's working with is toxic. Classic case of great reasoning, but zero knowledge to back it up. And the author goes even further, they give us these three pillars of knowledge divinity, humanities, science. Like a balanced intellectual meal, I guess. Right. Each one gives you a different way of seeing the world. And if you're neglecting one, your whole perspective gets warped. And they talk about the power of language within all this using the ancient Greeks. Oh, the Greeks were serious about their language. Yeah. Mastering it, to them, that was like fundamental to clear thinking. Words aren't just for information. They shape how we understand everything. Makes you wonder, right? How much of our understanding today is being shaped by, like, clickbait headlines and tweets? Not exactly the peak of nuanced language, you know? It's like we're trying to build a house on sand, you know? Right. Shaky foundations all around. Exactly. And if we can't even grasp language, how are we supposed to have these big, important conversations, these debates? How do we even begin to solve these complex problems? It's like we're losing the ability to actually hear each other, let alone understand. Which gets me to what the author says about science, which I thought was interesting. They're saying even science needs a sense of wonder. Oh, absolutely. They're worried we teach it too dry, too focused on the useful stuff, not the, I don't know, the magic of it. Yeah, yeah. They use that example of the little girl asked about photosynthesis, and she just writes, I think that's very wonderful. Right. Not the technical breakdown, just pure awe. It's like when you see, I don't know, one of those nature documentaries, right? Like those deep sea creatures, all bioluminescent, and you're just like, how does that even exist? It's awe-inspiring. Exactly. That's what the author wants more of in science education. That wonder that drives real discovery, not just, here's how to make a thing. Yeah, instead of just, here's how to build a bridge, it's also, the universe works in this amazing way. Isn't that wild? Yes. They mentioned Lister, Pastor, these huge names in science, they got that. Their work mattered because it wasn't just facts, it was about making life better for everyone. Which makes you think about how we talk about science now, you know? It's all about the newest gadget, living longer. Which is great, don't get me wrong, but... But the author might say we're missing the bigger picture. That wonder, that's what makes us want to learn in the first place. Without it, science is just cold, almost irrelevant. It's that awe that gets you curious, and then you want to learn, you question things, you innovate. Knowing the facts versus being truly engaged with them, big difference. And that takes us to what I thought was maybe the most, I don't know, profound part, this whole idea of bread alone. Oh, yeah. The author's critique of how much we focus on just stuff, on success, the cost of, 
I guess you'd call them spiritual things. Purpose, connection, belonging, all that. Exactly. Like chasing bread, material stuff, it's left this emptiness. Yeah. And that emptiness, it has real consequences. And they get into the historical examples to show that the trade guilds, the Russian commune. Right, like the guilds, they started out about craftsmanship, yeah. about community, mm -hmm. everyone working together. And then it became about power, about money, and the whole point got lost. Exactly. And the Russian communes, on paper, they sound kind of ideal. Right? Sharing everything, working towards a common goal, yeah. But as the author points out, it turned into control, oppression. Just sharing material wealth doesn't mean everyone's fulfilled or that they even agree on what they're working towards. Right. So it's not enough to just have a system, even if it's meant to be good. If we forget those spiritual things, the human side of it, it all falls apart no matter what. And I think the author's saying that's exactly where we're messing up now. Mm -hmm. We're all about efficiency, producing more, getting richer. But forgetting about connection, purpose, belonging. Exactly. So, okay, what do we do about it? This sounds like a huge shift we need. The author doesn't give, like, a step-by-step -step plan, but they keep coming back to those spiritual things. Yeah. Duty, responsibility, actually caring about other people. Not just as, like, a nice idea, but as the foundation of a good society. Right. It's like, yeah, it takes a village, but we have to mean it. Yeah. You know, we're all connected. What I do affects you, what you do. It all matters. And they end on this image coming out of a dark tunnel into the light, onto this bright plane. It's hopeful, but also says, do we have to choose that to move toward the light? And that's what I like most about this article, honestly. It doesn't just lay out the problems. It's like, okay, now what are you going to do? Yeah. Makes you think about the info you take in, how you look at the world. And that we can't just chase stuff. We have to have those values tying us together. Big stuff, but... But important. And if this got you thinking, definitely check out the whole article, Knowledge, Reason, and Rebellion. It's one of those deep dives that might just change how you see things, and not just today. 